Welcome to Independent Events, The Law of Total Probability and Markov Chains. This is a video lesson for probability and statistics. Conditional probability gives rise to several important concepts. These include independent events, the law of total probability, and the differences between joint, conditional, and marginal probability. After introducing these concepts, we will put them to work for us to build a modeling tool called a Markov chain. Earlier, we looked at an example that illustrated that the probability that a randomly selected athlete practices daily depends on whether we select that athlete from the overall group of 95 athletes in the school or from the group of 40 whom we know to excel. In situations like this, we say that these events are dependent upon each other. There are some events which we should, at least intuitively, expect to not be dependent. For instance, let B be the event that a fair coin is tossed and lands displaying heads. Let A be the event that the same coin is tossed a second time and lands displaying heads. Intuitively, the outcome of the first coin toss should have no effect upon the outcome of the second one. They should be unrelated. Thus, we should be able to say that P of A equals 0.5 and P of A given B equals 0.5. The fact that we know that the coin has landed displaying heads once should not change the fact that the coin is a fair coin. The probability that it displays heads on any individual coin toss should always be 0.5. The coin scenario suggests a definition. In fact, it suggests the definition of independent events. Two events, A and B, are independent if P of A given B equals P of A. This definition gives rise to the following theorem as well. Two events A and B are independent if and only if P of A intersect B equals P of A times P of B. This theorem is called the special multiplication formula because it's a special case of the general multiplication formula we've seen earlier. Like any good theorem, we should ask ourselves why it's true and attempt to prove it, and it turns out that this theorem isn't overly difficult to prove. In fact, if we start with the definition of independence and replace the conditional probability P of A given B with what the definition of conditional probability tells us it should be, we'll arrive at a formula that we can rearrange with one or two elementary steps of algebra in order to arrive at the special multiplication formula. You should try it on your own. Now we'll illustrate independence with an example. Let's let H and T represent the events that a fair coin toss results in heads and tails respectively, and we'll assume that P of H equals P of T equals 0.5 or 50%. We'll also assume that the outcomes of future coin tosses are independent of outcomes of past coin tosses. With this in mind, let's compare two different cases. So consider the probability of tossing a coin six times and having it display heads all of those times. We might be interested in determining the probability of six individual coin tosses in a row. This is the same as P of H intersect H intersect H intersect H intersect H intersect H. And the special multiplication formula tells us that this is no different than P of H times 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 P of H. Since P of H is always 0.5, this results in a numerical value of 0.5 raised to the sixth power, or 1 over 64. As we can see, it's a somewhat improbable event. However, it is no more or less improbable than any particular sequence of six coin tosses. For instance, you should be able to construct an argument very similar to the one that we've just looked at that will tell you that the probability of a head coin toss followed by a tails coin toss and another tails coin toss, then two heads coin tosses, and then one tails coin toss is 1 over 64 as well. You should try to work out why that's true. We'll now consider another case in which we ask ourselves, what's the probability of a coin toss that displays heads if it's known that the coin has been tossed five times already and it has displayed heads all five times? 
In other words, we're asking what is the probability of heads, or h, given a sequence of five h's. We know that the outcome of any coin toss is independent of its entire past history of coin tosses. Therefore, using the definition of independence, p of h given h, 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 h is simply just p of h, or 50%. With independent events, we are not justified in letting the rarity of a past history color our perception of the probability of the next outcome. Illustrate this further by considering the following statement. P of h given h t h t h is equal to P of h given h h t t h, but that's also equal to P of h given t t t t t and all three of those conditional probabilities are equal to p of h or 50 percent. Now we'll consider another concept, the law of total probability. The law of total probability is a consequence of the general multiplication formula that we learned when we first introduced conditional probability. It is a tool that allows us to decompose the probability of one event into a sum of two or more terms involving conditional probabilities. One of the more important applications of the law of total probability will appear in our next chapter on Bayes' theorem. However, we shall state and prove the theorem now because it's also important in developing the theory of Markov chains and Markov models, which will be one of the major applications from our current unit. We'll go ahead and formally state the law of total probability as a theorem, and then later on we'll worry about why it's true. So suppose A and B, or alternatively A and B1, B2, all the way up through Bn, where B1 through Bn are mutually exclusive events, for all i equals 1 through n, and their union equals the sample space. We're going to suppose these events all belong to the same probability space, then the following two statements alternatively are true. Either P of A equals P of A given B times P of B plus P of A given B complement times P of B complement. Or P of A equals P of A given B1 times P of B1 plus P of A given B2 times P of B2 plus all the way up through P of A given Bn times P of Bn. Well, that's clearly a mouthful. So we'll try to gain some insight into why it's true, first by proving it, and then by illustrating it with some examples. So first we'll prove the first formula. Now even though A and B are arbitrary events in the same probability space, omega s p, B and B complement form a mutually exclusive partition of the sample space omega. What this means is that B intersect B complement is the empty set. They share no outcomes in common, and B union B complement forms the entire sample space. Because of this, A intersect B and A intersect B complement form a mutually exclusive partition not of the sample space but of A itself. This is because A intersect B intersect A intersect B complement simplifies to A intersect B intersect B complement, and that further simplifies to A intersect the empty set, which is, by default, the empty set. What that tells us is that A intersect B and A intersect B complement are, in fact, mutually exclusive. But we can also observe that A intersect B union A intersect B complement is equal to A intersect the quantity B union B complement. That's through one of our distributive laws. And that further simplifies to A intersect the sample space, or omega. And by default, that's going to further simplify to A itself. So that tells us that A intersect B and A intersect B complement form a partition of A. Therefore, and here we're going to make use of the special addition formula, the probability of A can be rewritten as the probability of A intersect B union 
A intersect B complement. There we're just rewriting A as its partition. But through the special addition formula, that can be rewritten as the probability of A intersect B plus the probability of A intersect B complement. And then finally, if we apply the general multiplication formula to each of those two intersections, we can rewrite our formula as being equal to the probability of A given B times the probability of B plus the probability of A given B complement times the probability of B complement. And that's just formula one from the law of total probability. Well, now we'll prove formula two, which is really just a generalization of formula one. Since B1, B2, B3, all the way up through Bn form a mutually exclusive partition of the sample space, we may rewrite A in the following way. A equals A intersect omega intersection of A with the sample space, and that is equal to A intersect the union of B1 through B2 through B3 all the way up to Bn. And then finally, through repeated uses of one of our distributive laws, that may be rewritten as A intersect B1, union A intersect B2, union A intersect B3, union all the way up to A intersect B sub n. So with that, we've established that A intersect B1 through A intersect B2, all the way up through A intersect B n, form a partition of A. So next we'll establish that A intersect B1, A intersect B2, all the way up through A intersect B n, form a set of mutually exclusive events. And to do that, we'll take an arbitrary A intersect B sub i and an, another arbitrary A intersect B j for any i and j that aren't equal to each other. We're going to intersect those two events with each other. So A intersect B i intersect A intersect B j equals A intersect B i intersect B j. It's just a simplification. But since B i and B j are mutually exclusive, those intersect to form the empty set. A intersect the empty set is itself the empty set. Therefore, A intersect BI intersect A intersect BJ will always equal the empty set as long as I and J are not the same. This tells us that A intersect B1, A intersect B2, all the way up through A intersect BN form not only a partition of A, but they're mutually exclusive as well. Knowing this allows us to compute the probability of A mostly by making an appeal to Kolmogorov's third axiom of probability, or the special addition formula. In other words, the probability of A can be rewritten as the probability of A intersect B1, union A intersect B2, union all the way up to A intersect Bn. That's simply because we know that A intersect B1 through A intersect Bn form a partition of A. But that can be rewritten as the probability of A intersect B1 plus the probability of A intersect B2 plus all the way up to the probability of A intersect Bn. And that's because that partition is mutually exclusive. And that's where Kolmogorov's third axiom comes in. But then if we apply the special multiplication formula from the definition of conditional probability to each of those intersections in the sum, we can rewrite them. And what we rewrite them as is the probability of A given B1 times the probability of B1 plus probability of A given B2 times the probability of B2 plus all the way up through probability of A given Bn times the probability of Bn. This, however, is just the statement of the second formula from the law of total probability. The law of total probability yields some terminology often seen in conjunction with conditional probability. Recall, we already defined the conditional probability P of A given B equals P of A intersect B over P of B to be the probability of A occurring given knowledge that B has occurred. In contrast, we'll now define joint probability, 
and marginal probability. The joint probability of two events A and B is denoted P of A comma B, and it represents the probability of observing both A and B. In other words, P of A comma B equals P of A intersect B. The joint probability of a collection of events A1, A2 through AN is denoted by P of A1 comma A2 comma all the way up through AN and it represents the probability of observing all n of the events in the collection. In other words, p of a1, comma, a2, all the way up through a n, is just equal to the probability of the intersection over a1 through a n. Finally, we can define marginal probability. The marginal probability of an event a is simply the probability of a irrespective of other events in the same probability space or it's just probability of A. The marginal probability of an event gets its name from the process of marginalizing. Suppose we had a contingency table that summarizes the relationships between events A, B, and C, etc., in a mutually exclusive set of events M1, M2, all the way up through M sub N. That contingency table might look structurally like the one that we see now. The probabilities of A, B, or C, etc. can be found by summing the joint probabilities along their respective rows. For example, the probability of A equals the probability of A intersect M1 plus the probability of A intersect M2 all the way up through the probability of A intersect Mn. And this can be found in the total margin of the table. If you think about it, this is just the law of total probability with the probability of A given M sub I times the probability of M sub I replaced with the probability of A intersect M sub I for each I equals one through two all the way up through N using the general multiplication formula. We'll see the terms joint probability, conditional probability, and marginal probability again when we worked with Bayesian inference and Bayesian learning later on. Before we get into those Bayesian applications of conditional probability, we'll spend some time on an application of the law of total probability that gets us into an introduction of Markov chains and Markov modeling. This is a continuation of our example on vegetation dynamics and desert plant communities that we began earlier. We're now at the stage where we can make some assumptions about our model. Earlier, we began developing a Markov chain model for vegetation dynamics. We introduced the random variable x sub t with its possible values of 1, 2, or 3 that represent the events that a patch of land is dominated by a shrub species, a grass species, or is bare ground at some time t. Now make the following assumptions. First, we'll assume that each patch of land under observation is dominated by exactly one of the three categories. Next, we'll assume that if a landscape is currently dominated by a particular vegetation category, there is a fixed chance that the landscape will remain dominated by that category after a given time interval, a year for instance. And there are fixed chances that the landscape will transition to being dominated by one of the other two categories as well. So now we'll propose a simplified discrete time model for succession between the three vegetation categories that adopts our assumptions and retains the essence of what McAuliffe described in Markovian Dynamics of Simple and Complex Desert Plant Communities, which he published in 1988. Let P of X of T equal one, P of X of T equals two, and P of X of T equals three represent the probabilities that the patch of land is dominated by each of the three states at time T. Increment time forward from T by a discrete step to T plus one. Predict P of X of T plus one equals one, P of X of T plus one equals two, and P of X of T plus one equals three the probability is that the patch of land will be dominated by each of the three states at time t plus 1, given the knowledge of the same probabilities at time t. Well, in order to write down a model that relates the probabilities at the future time step to the probabilities at the past time step, we're going to invoke the law of total probability. In other words, p of x sub t plus 1 equals 1 
equals p of x sub t plus 1 equals 1 given x sub t equals 1 times p of x sub t equals 1 plus p of x sub t plus 1 equals 1 given x sub t equals 2 times p of x sub t equals 2 plus p of x sub t plus 1 equals 1 given x sub t equals 3 times p of x sub t equals 3. And similarly, for p of x sub t plus 1 equals 2 and p of x sub t plus 1 equals 3. If you know something about matrices and linear algebra, you'll know that these equations are linear in the variables p of x sub t equals 1, p of x sub t equals 2, and p of x sub t equals 3. Therefore, they can be written in the equivalent matrix form, which we've displayed here below. The matrix in this model is called the transition matrix because of the way it summarizes the probabilities of making a transition from one state at an old time step to a new state at the new time step. The conditional probabilities in the first column represent the chances that a patch of land will transition from being dominated by a shrub species at time t, x sub t equals 1, to one of the other species at the next time step. The second and third columns represent the same thing except that the transition in question is made from the grass species, x sub t equals 2, or bare land, x sub t equals 3, respectively. At this point, we've written down a model in two different forms that both incorporate our modeling assumptions. So we can move on to the next phase of the SIAM modeling process, which is getting a solution. To do so, we can simply iterate the model in order to predict the probabilities of each of the three states over time. To do this, we'll measure some initial values for the probabilities a patch of land is currently dominated by each of the three vegetation categories. Then we'll apply the model by multiplying these probabilities on the left by the transition matrix to compute the state probabilities at time t equals 1. At that point, we can continue this process indefinitely. Each new set of state probabilities gets multiplied by the transition matrix on the left in order to compute a new set of state probabilities at the very next time step. If we were to plot these probabilities over time, they might look something like what we see in the following figure. Here, the blue trace represents the probability that a patch of land is dominated by shrubs. The red trace represents the probability that this patch of land is dominated by grass species. And the yellow trace represents the probability that that patch of land will just be expressed as bare ground. You might notice that each of the three probabilities seem to be approaching a constant value. Over time, this model predicts that 33% of the land will be dominated by shrub species, roughly 18% of the land will be dominated by grasses, and the remaining 49% will be dominated by bare ground. In order to complete a cycle of the modeling process for this model, we still have three major tasks ahead of us we must devise a way for measuring our initial state probabilities. In order to truly calibrate our model to a specific desert plant community, we will need to develop a way of estimating the transition probabilities from measurable data. Only then can we actually obtain a prediction from the model that has a reasonable chance of describing the reality of that plant community. Later, we will demonstrate one approach for doing this. Once we have obtained predictions from our model, we will still have some analysis and assessment to perform for this model. We must have a way of assessing the accuracy of our predictions in comparison to our data. You will develop techniques for performing this assessment and analysis by the time you have learned hypothesis testing. Finally, we'll need to report on our results. We'll offer a model for what a simplified scientific article describing our efforts might look like. The upshot of this is that we've still got a fair amount of work to do before we can execute these remaining steps of the SIAM modeling process for the vegetation dynamics and desert plant communities example. However, in the meantime, you can still gain some practical experience of building the model and iterating it over time so that you can actually see a solution. 
based upon some made up initial data and some made up transition probabilities. That'll occur in the upcoming technological companion to this video lesson. And with that, we're at the end of this video lesson. I hope you found it helpful. Thank you for watching and please join us with the upcoming technological companion to this video lesson on implementing a simple Markov chain model in MATLAB.